Have you ever heard of the Judgment of Paris? This 1976 wine tasting, arguably one of the most important wine tastings in the history of the world, helped launch Napa Valley. And it would not have been known about, save for one intrepid reporter. Sip episode 138, The Judgment of Paris, begins now. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Martin Cody, co-founder of Cellar Angels, a direct-to-consumer wine company showcasing the best limited production wineries coming out of Napa and Sonoma right now. Founded in 2010, our mission is simply to give these wonderful wineries a platform to reach higher-end wine enthusiasts around the United States without having to travel and spend tens of thousands of dollars to do it. The wine that won the Judgment of Paris red wine was Cabernet Sauvignon. And tonight we can think of no one better to talk about Cabernet Sauvignon, specifically Napa Valley Cabernet Sauvignon, than this evening's guest. And we're going to break down the judgment of Paris with none other than Chad Angelo from Angelo Cellars. So Chad, thank you so much for joining. Oh, thank you for having me. Cheers. And I am going to uh, take a sip of the Yates family and we'll get deep into the details on that. Let's do it. Awesome. Oh, man, that is opening up wonderfully. So tonight's topic is the judgment of Paris. It is not hyperbolic. It is not exaggerational to say that this was the sentinel, most prolific wine tasting event in the history of the wine or the world. When did you first learn about it? And, and how did it land with you? I first kind of got into it when I started going to Napa. And I looked it up and started reading about it. Um, you know, Napa has an interesting history. And really, 1976 and this, quote, little event uh, sure changed it. Mm -hmm. And uh, going forward, I think that uh, understanding what it what, what it was intended to be and what it resulted in are two different things significantly. Right. Well, let's, we'll pause there for a second, because I also want to give you an opportunity. You said when you first started going to Napa. So no, I know a little bit about your backstory, but for folks that are the uninitiated, we have a, a bunch of new folks on and we're thrilled because they don't often get an opportunity to meet a winemaker from the comfort of their own home. Uh, but it's interesting to always hear how someone gets bit by the bug. And, and decides, okay, I think I might want to pursue this a little bit more than just casual drinking on the weekends. And, and you had a very, you know, established career as a rocket scientist with Boeing. I kid you not, ladies and gentlemen. So when I tell Chad, it's nothing, it's not like rocket science. He says, yes, it is because he's a <laughs> rocket scientist. So tell us a little bit how you went from Boeing to start doing trips to Napa and really getting, taking this for more than a hobby. Well, uh, in college, I got into wine because Missouri is where I went to college. And it was, most people don't know, but Missouri is the seventh largest producer of, by volume of wine in the United States. As a matter of fact, Missouri had the first AVA in the United States. So large wow. German population settled there and started the wine industry there. So poor college student, free tastings. What do you do on a Saturday? Go drinking. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> So uh, after I was in St. Louis after in, in my career with uh, McDonnell, Douglas, and Boeing, uh, then I moved to Dallas for four years, which is a huge food and booze mecca in the United States. Just, I don't know why they put kitchens and houses. Nobody eats at home out down there. And I got into wine big time down there. And that's when I first started going to Napa was when I kind of got the, the bug as far as uh, drinking wine. Then... Uh, I actually got it into another, got into a winery investment in Temecula, California, uh, before getting this into Napa, but that kind of bridged the gap. But I fell in love with Napa cabs. I mean, that's my that's my favorite. If it, if I'm gonna drink anything, day in day out, it's gonna be Napa cabs, and that's where I kind of got into it. So started started with one one barrel. Uh, in 2005 vintage and it's kept going ever since can't stop and it's it, and some of those 
And, and Chad, not only we're, we'll pull on this thread a little bit, but uh, Chad, much like many of the the small production wineries, is incredibly gracious uh, with his wines and sharing. Uh, and I see a, a young man, Sean, on the broadcast this evening. Also, hi to Peter G, Nick, Moira, Moira. Collect, correct me on the uh, in the chat on how horrible I pronounced your name. Uh, Larry R, thank you for all the information. And Karen, always good to see you. But we actually got to taste some of Chad's earlier 2005 vintages and, and some of the other stuff uh, at a tasting in Denver not too long ago. Uh, I'm curious, when you first started learning about the Judgment of Paris, because it is, uh, I mean, it's it's the wine shot that was heard around the world. And it's, tell me a little bit about when you started to research it and, and what you found out. Well, when I, when I, after, I think it was after my second trip to Napa, I started really getting into it and uh, finding more out about it. Um, what I learned was that what... Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. What it was planned to be and what it ended up to be were two different things. Um, Spurrier, who had the came up with the idea for it, um, was just a small businessman trying to kind of like all the rest of us here. I mean, you know, try to sell wine. And and he had learned that, you know, there's good wine out there. Um, but how, how do you get it out there? And that, that was the basis for it. But as we get into this a little bit more as we go, but it just ballooned into something that nobody ever thought it would. Um, and the time frame is what I think is interesting. And, and we've talked about this, that uh, in relation to Napa versus France, I mean, France has been making wine for centuries. Right. And, you know, basically the 1880s is when Napa really kind of got started. So and it, it was been a hundred years of history. Yeah, it's to it's get impressive started. To, think, to think about, to your point, just how long France had been doing this versus how long California had been doing this. I mean, California was in its infancy uh, from that standpoint. And just to, I think it'd be good to level set everyone on, on what was happening. So I'm gonna, Chad and I are gonna walk through a deck and kind of set the table for what was happening. So now we're gonna go all the way back to 1976. So many of you may not have been alive. I was 10. Uh, so well, not drinking a lot of wine at 10. Now at 11, different story, knocking it back at 11. Uh, not so much at 10, though. So here's, you know, from a geopolitical standpoint, what was happening in 76. Keep in mind that the 76 Summer Olympics were in Montreal. A, a man named Bruce Jenner won the decathlon, uh, which then made him, by definition, the greatest athlete on earth because he won gold medal in the 10 hardest events in track and field. But also what was happening, you have Carter defeat Gerald Ford to win the presidency. Pittsburgh Steelers, Super Bowl champs. Anybody want to throw in chat who the big red machine is? I'll, I'll let Mission Control let me know if anybody gets it correct. They were the World Series champs. Mission Control is informing me that she doesn't know who the big red machine is. That will make it very difficult for her to determine a correct answer. I'm going to go with the Reds. Very good. Cincinnati Reds, Mission Control on the button. A McDonald's Big Mac was 75 cents back then and still had actually no real ingredients. Average family income, 16 grand. Average home, $43,000. This is going back not that long ago. A $43,000 home was average. Price of gasoline, 59 cents. And this is post, by the way, 59 cents is high because it, in the 1973-74 oil embargo, gas was 32 cents. But then within 12 months, it went up to 50, 55 cents and 59 cents in 76. One of the best movies ever. Jack Nicholson and One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, one best picture. Happy Days, number one show in the country, followed by Laverne and Shirley Mash, and dare I say, a name of angels, Charlie's Angels. It can't beat the angels. Eggs were 97 cents a dozen. I don't know what eggs got up to during the pandemic, but I think I heard supper up like eight, nine dollars a dozen. So 97 cents a dozen for eggs. Unemployment rate pretty high at 7.8. Inflation rate 5.7. 
The 30-year mortgage was 8.8, .8, but four years later in 1980, that went past surging past 14%. So things were tense. Uh, you know, you had, the, like I mentioned, the oil embargo, geopolitical stuff was, was still kind of raw. You had the 72 Olympics in Munich that was just four years prior that had hostage situations and murders. And then we are four years before the Miracle on Ice where the United States wins the gold in Lake Placid. That kind of just sets the the time frame element. Chad, anything in there trip your memory bank and jump out at you? Oh yeah, um, I think the other things to to remember during that time frame because I, I was ten at the time too, so was not drinking wine yet. But um, it was a tough time for Americans at that time, inflation and interest rates and so forth. And you look back. 10 years past, you had the Rat Pack and uh, Las Vegas and Hollywood and so forth. And there was so much of the cocktail type thing. Oh, right. In the 70s, it was baseball and beer. So wine really wasn't a big presence in the United States like it is or uh, where, it, where it was in Europe. Europe, it was more of a day-to-day -day thing where in the United States, it really wasn't. So that's something to think about, too, of, of where Napa was. And we're coming back from prohibition a, into a, uh, an economic inflation area. So tough times. That Very tough times. And it's interesting. Some of the comments are spot on. Doug and Lorraine graduated high school in 76. And I totally forgot Nadia Comaneci scored a perfect 10 at the Montreal Olympics. Um, Unbelievably, I was actually at the Montreal Olympics, not certain why dad thought that was a good sporting event for a 10 year old and his brothers and sisters to go to, but uh, we did. So let's talk a little bit about what else happened in 1976. One month prior to the judgment of Paris, a couple of gentlemen out of California garage named Steve Jobs and Mr. Wozniak invented the personal computer. April 1st, 1976, this was your personal computer. Uh, not portable not a smartphone, uh, that might not even be a color television, but that was your personal computer in 1976. And that's amazing how far we've come compared to the technology in our smart smartphones today. So let's talk about the judgment of Paris because Chad set it up perfectly. There was a lot of uncertainty, a lot of unease going on in the, in the, in the, around the globe. And so the winners of this event, uh, these are, it's a snapshot from the Smithsonian archives because these two bottles of wine are in the Smithsonian. So you've had the 1973 Chateau Montalena Chardonnay and the Stag's Leap Wine Cellars uh, 1972, or it might be 73, I'll get to that in a second, Cabernet Sauvignon. But what you need to know, and Chad hate upon this, is that how this got set up was, was kind of accidental. And the, one of the main characters was Stephen Spurrier. So Chad, what do you know about Stephen? Uh, Stephen was British and was in the wine industry. And a lot of people probably don't realize that in the 70s, the greatest export importer of wines was Great Britain from France. So the world market as we know it today for wine from Australia and South America and South Africa, and it wasn't there at that point in time. It was very small. Uh, but he also had a little wine store and wine, wine school in France. And that's yep. where this kind of got started, the idea of doing something like this. But there so, was another there was another character that yeah. helped us kicked off. Well, and think about it, 1976, what we just went through from a historical perspective. And, and Stephen is a British citizen, and, and Chad is absolutely correct. The UK was the largest importer of French wines for decades. And it wasn't until recently, and I, someone can probably research it. I don't have the exact year, but I'm guessing it was, you know, like 2014, 2015, 2016, when the United States finally started importing more French wines than the UK. But Spurrier is a very infectious individual, uh, passionate, passionate individual with regards to wine, wine teaching, kindness, education. Uh, he was a wine merchant and he had a shop in downtown Paris. So his shop uh, was essentially the La Cave de la Mandeline, uh, right in downtown Paris. He also uh, opened up France's first 
private wine educational uh, school, if you will, the Academy du Vin, which is right next door to his shop. Now imagine that you have a UK gentleman has a wine shop in Paris, and the UK gentleman is the first one to open up a private wine education area in Paris. I mean, it's incredible uh, how much foresight he had to be able to do these sorts of things and entrepreneurial spirit. Uh, oops, he was a business partner, and this is what Chad was just alluding to. You know, Stephen didn't actually come up with the idea to, to maybe start showcasing some of the Californian wines. He had an American business partner, Patricia Gallagher, who got the ball rolling. How did that happen, Chad? Uh, she actually went to California on a trip for wine. And uh, as of course, back in the 70s, it isn't like it is today. There wasn't probably even a map showing you where all the wineries were back then. But uh, she she tasted some wines and thought they were absolutely fabulous. Um, and she got a hold of him and said, hey, you need to check this out. You You need to come out and check that out. And that's where it kind of got started is that he took her idea of going out there to California uh, to check it out. And he was very reluctant, I think, uh, from what I've read, uh, and resistant to think that California would be as good as it was. And, and I think it's, it's, it's actually interesting too, because in the movie, I mean, there's a loose adaptation of this event or this tasting uh, called Bottle Shock. Many of you have seen it. But in the movie, it indicates that he was desperate to, you know, have some sort of a competition or raise awareness for his, his quote unquote struggling wine store. His wine store was by no means struggling. His school was by no means struggling. Uh, so that part among many of the movie uh, are inaccurate. But to Chad's point, Patricia came back from a trip to the West Coast and said, you need to go check this out. These folks are making some wines out there that I can stand on their own. So Stephen did go out, and in 1975, he he went up, you know, to Napa and Sonoma, and then decided to get the ball rolling, and and he had no idea what was about to transpire and occur, because it was really just a matter of let's see what can happen, let's let's figure out how do we get these American wines up against French wines, and the interesting thing was because Stephen spoke English that when American winemakers were traveling in Europe and they had some of their wares with them, they would always be invited to stop in and taste. And so Stephen had an amazing palate, number one, uh, but number two, it was he had built up a little bit of a confidence and trust with a lot of the American winemakers. So when he reached out to ask them, would you be interested? Most of them said yes. And, and, and he talks about the fact that why wouldn't I do something like this? I want to give, this is going to sound familiar, Sipsters. I want to give a platform to these small developing wineries so that they can gain greater exposure, be more successful, because he knew that that would help the industry as a whole. Uh, and as he says, these were very, very good wines. So why wouldn't I do something about it? You have to like that in 1976 when he decides to take it upon himself to basically have a competition the likes of which had never been done pretty pretty thankful for that so let's set up the competition now you first have to and i'm going to move some pictures out of the way get get an example of the judges uh these were really the who's who of french wine nobility so there's a couple of names i want to point out here pierre brejou he sits on the aoc so that's like sitting on the board of the AVA of, you know, Oakville or Spring Mountain. And this is a person that makes the designation and votes on whether or not you can be an AOC wine. You also have uh, a couple restaurants down here. These are all Michelin star restaurants. And the Sommelier Christian Venequet uh, at Tour de Jean and Tellevant. I've had the privilege of eating at Tellevant. Uh, these are a murderer's row of wine experts. Uh, not only that, Patricia Gallagher, who we were just talking about as the American, who actually taught at the El Academy du Vin that Stephen opened, and Stephen Spurrier, while these were the judges, and there's 11 folks there, Spurrier's vote and Patricia's vote didn't count. Yeah. They, they were removed. So if you're assembling, you know, who's who of the top judges and top 
you know, sommeliers and palates in France, this was the list they put together. Any, uh, anything jump out at you here, Chad? Uh, I think it's just, like you said, it's the who's who. You look at where they came from, and unfortunately, probably at this point in time, many of them are gone by now, uh, just because it's been so long ago. But um, at that point in time, uh, this was the who's who of French wine. Yeah, and, and you had Odette Kahn. She's the editor of, you know, the, the high, it'd be like the wine spectator equivalent of France. So they're a great trade rag. Uh, Stephen Spurrier, uh, sadly, just passed away in 2021 and uh, really instrumental in catapulting the American wine scene. Uh, so these are the judges. Next, we're going to go to uh, a picture of them all at the tasting table. By the way, there's so much material out here. This is one of the funnest topics I ever got to research for SIP in three years. Uh, but here you have Spurrier in the center of the table. And if you've seen <laughs> the movie Bottle Shock, I'm telling you, this guy is the spitting image of Dennis Farina, who was in the movie, uh, but it's not Dennis. So, but these are all the folks, uh, the upper elite echelon of French wine judges at the tasting. Accidentally, there was one media person there. And if it had not happened, I'm not certain it gets broadcast or televised. No one, journalism-wise, wanted to cover this because it was such a fait accompli. It was going to be a bloodbath. It was going to be, no one, everyone turned it down. Why would I want to cover this? It, it would be like, you know, the Super Bowl champ Pittsburgh Steelers playing my high school team. It's not going to happen. Uh, but George Tabor from Time Magazine decided, okay, I'm going to go. I'm going to drink some wine. Uh, everybody knows French wines are going to win. Why waste a day? It's the giant. Nobody took it seriously. So all of the other media people turned it down. Tabor's the only journalist there. And I strongly recommend, you know, as summer continues on, if you want to grab a book, Tabor's book, and you may have read it, Chad, on the judgment of Paris is mandatory reading for wine lovers. It's fascinating. It is. So then we have the tasting and judging method. Blind tasting. Chad, what are your feelings about blind tasting? Well, to be honest, you, you, a blind tasting is the best way to compare wines without bringing the whole name, the pedigree, and so forth. You're, you're tasting what's in the bottle. So it, it, it is the way to do it. Um, with this one, they, they did a 20-point system uh so they could rank they could give the wine uh, uh up to 20 points which would be perfect or anything in between um and then that's how they kind of put it together and then they ranked them and then they averaged the scores together uh of the of the not of the judges so interesting so yeah it's i, I like it that they had a 20 point grading system but there was no specific metrics required for how you allocated the points. And I'll discuss more on that in a second. Um, the rankings of the wines preferred by individual judges were based on the grades. They individually granted those wines. So they tabulated them. An overall ranking of the wines preferred by the jury was also established in averaging the sum of each judge's individual grades. So they took the arithmetic mean. And as I said earlier, you know, Patricia's and Stephen's grades and points were not taken into account, only counting the nine grades of the, of the esteemed French judges. So they did the whites first, as one would do in a tasting. And uh, the white wines tasting, you had Montalena, 1973 vintage, Chalone Vineyard, 74, Spring Mountain, 73, Freemark Abbey, 72, Vedercrest Vineyard, 72, David Bruce Winery. Uh, as Chad said, there was no map to Napa Valley wineries in 1976. This might have been five of the 15 or 20 wineries that existed. Maybe there was a few more, uh, but they were going up against some juggernauts on the French side, all white burgundies. Uh, and, you know, in Batard Montrachet, Pouligny Montrachet, they're still around today. Of interest, what, what I find fascinating is you know, some of these are household names. Vitra Crest, I was unaware of. 
And so in, in doing research on Vita Crest, they went back a hundred years. I mean, these folks were there for a long time. They had wines after this event served at the White House for state dinners. Jimmy Carter served their wines. They had wines served with the Pope's dinner in Philadelphia. And, and it's amazing. David Bruce, Spring Mountain, Shalom, Montalena, all still around. Uh, and I think, correct me if I'm wrong, didn't Spring Mountain, Chad, just come out of receivership or get sold? Yeah, they've been in the news since last fall when they filed for bankruptcy, and uh, they have just recently been sold and they're restructuring to continue. And for anybody that's an American, you know, into TV, that is where Falcon Crest House is that was on the famous nighttime uh, uh, soap opera back in the 80s. Was yep. filmed. Uh, very famous estate. Very famous. And, and it's amazing because I think they have, I want to say something like, is it 864 acres? I mean, it's an un, it's a huge. Huge on Spring Mountain. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Huge. So the white wines and then the, the red wines also, you know, you got Stag's Leap. So it was 73 Ridge Vineyards, Montebello, Heights, Martha Vineyard, Clos Vall, Maya Camas, Freemark Abbey. All of them still wine producers today. Back then, they were the little guys. When you think about it, I mean, these were the up and comers, uh, Stag's Leap wine cellars, and they're going against Mouton Rochelle, Montrose, Hobrion, Chateau de These are the who's who of French Bordeaux. And these are who they're up against. And these are the pipsqueaks of California wine. I mean, Ridge Vineyards Montebello, now one of the most famous wines, famous vineyards in all of California. Martha's Vineyard right up there. Uh, Maya Camus, I know Scotland's not on, or I didn't see him, but huge fan of Maya Camus. Um, Freemark Abbey, still producing wonderful wines. But back then, these are the up and comers, the new boys. So it's interesting to see who they were up against. The results of the white section. Boom. Montalena, out of the nine judges, keep in mind the maximum score you could get is 180. My calculator, nine times 20 is 180 is correct. Uh, I'm using the personal computer that Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak invented, and it's taken a long time for that calculation to occur. Uh, but they scored a 132. And uh, the Mersal, you know, not that far behind. The rest of them are... are you know, first, second, and third are, are pretty close statistically, but then there's a little bit of a drop off with Spring Mountain and four through through eight. Uh, the Polygnum Hunter shape shocks me at basically 89 points, and this is nine esteemed French judges uh, not doing too well identifying their own wines. Uh, and Chad, any comment there on on things that jump out at you? Well, I think number one is of the top five, three are American. One, three, and four. Uh, yep. So, you know, um, kind of, kind of a a a statement there of style and taste and quality and and flavors. So but, now, in, interesting too. Uh, I mean, the, the results were fast, and the reaction was even swifter. So Jim Barrett, as you see down here at the bottom, this is the way they communicated back in 1976. This is a Western Union telegram. And this was his telegram when he ran out of the tasting to send to the winery back home. Stunning success in Paris tasting on May 24th. Stop. Took first place over nine others with Le Premier Cru wine. Stop. Top names in France were the blind tastings. Stop. Tastings is spelled wrong, FYI. Um, Time Magazine to do an article. Congratulations to everyone. Jim Barrett. Now, Jim is obviously the father of Bo Barrett, who's married to Heidi Barrett. A little bit of wine, you know, education and skill in that family. Uh, but this is even before the Reds were tasted. He ran out and, and sent this telegram. So that's how fast this shot was heard around the world. And interestingly enough, and, and Chad, I don't know if you saw this or read this. You probably did. I found it amazing that they read the results of the white tasting before they tasted the reds. Yes. Yes, uh, they they did. Um, 
I think that was planned in that they didn't think it was going to happen the way it did. Yes. So, you know, it was, and if you know the French, they're, they can, they can be a little headstrong and so forth. That Send all your letters to Chad Angelo, care of <laughs> Angelo Sellers. So, I mean, I, I think that, you know, especially when they read the, the, the top three, two of the top three were American. Right. And third. So, I mean, it, it was a shock because going into the red tasting, these judges were upset. You oh, know. you can you can say stronger than that. It's just this is uh we've got clearance from the studios. They were pissed. Yeah. This was this was a shock to them, and they were very upset because they are known for their white wines. They are known for beautiful white wines, and you go over there to France, and that's what you have, and you do all this, and it's you know. So they're they you can only imagine that they're like, okay, I've got to get really serious about this before we start tasting the reds because correct sure the reds the French win. They were. And Chad is correct. And they were hot. They were not happy. The Odette, the editor of the wine magazine that I referenced earlier, she demanded a recount. She thought there was a miscalculation. And so now they're going into the red tasting. And I think I can say this shit's about to get serious because they are not happy. And there's even uh, and on certain areas, I think Wikipedia has them. You can see the judges scorecards and the red tasting and the minute a judge, excuse me, the minute a judge determines that the wine that they're drinking is American and not France, they they gave it a two, a two out of twenty, instead of you know a seventeen or an eighteen or anything like that. So the the reaction both by Bo ba or uh, Jim Barrett was swift, but the reaction and the retaliatory measures of the French was also swift. So now we go on to the red tasting, and they are this is their coup de gras. This is what has put them on the wine map for three hundred years no one can ascend the pedestal that they are on so uh, except until now uh so, so this did not go well with the french the stag's leap 1973 had a grade of 127.5 uh it took first place and granted it's a point and a half above mouton a, you know two points above Aubryon. Uh, a couple points above or five a point above Montreux, but this was, if the white wine from Montalena slapped them in the face, uh, as has been said, it, this was a swift kick in the pants. And this one, I mean, is there anything there? It's kind of funny, and I'll get into this in a second. Uh, Chad, some of these are still tasting great today. Yes. Well, and I, I think that's important to say is that, you know, the French style and so forth, that they make wines that will last for 30, 40 years and so forth. And uh, you're coming, and, and that was one of the topics that after the competition, they were talking, oh, well, this was a very young vintage, and this was not the best vintage of all of our vintages that we would have. And the, the excuses started coming, and it's like, well, you had your choice of which to bring, you know, to the competition because uh, so forth. But you look, the Stags Leap 73, it was only three years old. I know. Of, of being bottled. So most likely it had been in barrel 18 months to two years, maybe, and then bottled. So it was pretty, pretty fresh in the bottle. Yeah, it's, it's incredible. I mean, I, you can't, as I said earlier, there, there's, it's not hyperbole. It, it, this is incredible to have this happen in Paris on their home field advantage with nine French judges that are the who's who of the wine evaluating, you know, sommelier educational aspect. And to have this happen uh, shocked the world. And not only did it happen once, it's happened about eight times since then because they did another tasting in 78. And by the way, the 1976 is the 200-year bicentennial of the United States, which is what Spurrier was trying to draw attention to. 
He was trying to capitalize on the fact that, hey, this is a very celebratory time for the United States. This is, uh, let's let's have some friendly rivalry with France. He, and he, he even said, you know, granted, we don't celebrate the United States independence here in the UK uh, to the degree that you do. So maybe we can get something going. So that was really one of the catalysts to, to leverage or, or ride on the coattails of the geopolitical celebration of the United States. I mean, keep in mind, remember we were minting coins for the bicentennial. Every town in America had a parade. It was a big thing. And so kudos to him for having the, the entrepreneurial chops to say, hey, we can ride this wave of emotion and let's have a wine competition. This is 30 years later, the results. You know, Ridge Montebello, 1971 wins. And this is a, a group of, this was done in San Francisco on the anniversary of the 76 tasting. And not only does, does the United States win, they win commandingly. Anything here, Chad, surprise you or just reaffirm, thank goodness I'm making wine in Napa Valley. <laughs> well, it, it, it kind of does because you look at it and when you think of French wines, you usually think that they get better and better over time to a certain point. And as we said, these are similar to what they are. And uh, the, these, of course, were the Reds, the Cabernets and the Bordeaux that were being competed here. But, you know, it, it also shows that the California cabs have the structure, have the tannins, have the acidity, to hold up over time also. I, but I think you, you have two different wine styles, uh, the French style, Bordeaux, so forth, but you have the California, which has a little bit more of a, uh, a, fruit, a bit of a fruitier style mm -hmm. than what it would be. So it becomes, you know, what the taste, but as you can see, time and time again, California has proven that it can compete with the big boys that have been there making wines for centuries in France. Correct. And, and, you know, fast forward now 40 plus years, these wineries are now household names uh, yeah. from, Cali from California. These were always household names from France. I mean, they, to this day, are still uh, highly sought after, highly acclaimed. Does anybody want to fathom a guess of what a bottle of the Stag's Leap, I'll go back, 1973 Cabernet Sauvignon cost in 1976. It was expensive. Uh, and, and then as we're waiting for those guesses to come in, uh, ooh, Mr. Brent H, <laughs> thanks, Jeff. Nope, not 813, not 899. <laughs> And you got a set of steak knives. No, I believe, and Chad, correct me if I'm wrong here. I, I think that bottle of wine, and it was expensive, according to Stephen Spurrier, was $6.50. Yes, Stag's Leap on release prior to the tasting was $6.50. <laughs> Goodness. All right. We're going to transition from the judgment of Paris to continuing with Cabernet Sauvignon from Napa Valley and, and pulling on why how, many, how much is it was it after? Uh you're gonna pay like twenty-eight thousand dollars or more right now. <laughs> if you can find it. Actually, um there was recently not it's not that much. There was recently oh, there was recently an auction. I don't know if it was by Barry Brothers in London or, or one of the famous auction houses auctioned off both those bottles and the Stag's Leap uh, went for just under $13,000. Oh, that's all. So I got two of them. I mean, I thought it was a deal. Uh, <laughs> no, yeah, it wasn't crazy. And there are, there are still, both wineries will tell you that they have dwindling supplies left of that library vintage and understandably so. And you can go to Montalena and, and see a bottle of the 73 Chardonnay, which interestingly enough, that bottle or that wine was made by Mikhail Girgic, Michael Girgic. And so those of you that know Girgic, sellers on Route 29, he made that wine. And Michael, if I'm not mistaken, just turned 100. I think you're right. It, 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 yeah, just month, a few months ago. Correct. And uh, we featured Girgic early on on Seller Angel's platform, uh, but... His, his Fumé Blanc 
set the you know winery industry on its tail. And and he interestingly enough, he was left out of the movie. Another person left out of the tasting, though, Chad, which surprises people is the Robert Mondavi winery. Now, um, yes. what are your thoughts on that? And, and what did we learn? Well, I think what what Spurrier was trying to do, like we said earlier, is Mondavi was already established in Napa. He'd been around a while, had been making wine, and it, it was making good wine. But he was trying to find the little guys. He was trying to set up that Napa had their big boys, but there was a whole entry in the 60s and 70s of these little startup wineries, which is very much like France. You have the big boys, but you have a lot of these little bitty small town mom and pop wineries that make stuff that tastes absolutely incredible but you're never going to find them unless you go there. And right. that's what I was doing was trying to set up that, you know, you can have the big boys, but there's also these little wineries that are startups that are coming around that can make just as good a wine as anybody else. And as we all know, most of the French and Italian, they don't export the really good stuff. No. <laughs> you got to go there and buy it and ship it back yourself. They right. don't export. So that was one of the big things that is uh, an interesting fact. And that's where the seller angels, all this kind of comes is that what we're trying to say is you can have your Ingle Nook, you can have your Camus, you can have all these big name stuff, but all these little guys that are making, you know, under a hundred case stuff has some absolutely fabulous stuff that you can, can get a lot of times at half the price and twice and the take. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and, and I, it's so amazing. I, I don't want, I don't use the term maverick lightly, but Spurrier was well ahead of his time in, in this uh, initiative, just to say the, the gentleman, and you can read book after book, and I encourage you to do so. Uh, Tabor's book is outstanding. There's a couple other books. Stephen Spurrier himself wrote a book on the event and, and his kindness, graciousness, sharing capacity for education is unrivaled. I mean, he just, he would take anybody under his wing and, and show them great wines and had no problem doing it. And we need more of those individuals. Uh, Eve, I see your question. I don't think the Bordeaux wines were too young because they had the option to bring whatever wines they wanted to bring and, and showcase them. And they, they age well. I, I think it was just lightning in a bottle from a standpoint of the Americans caught it and it's shocked the world and that's not under that's not an overstatement it shocked the world spurrier paid some consequences for this by the way it, quite quickly and in his own words he was person non grata he was kicked out of tasting areas he was not allowed in cellars he was and these were cellars where he had good friends wineries and chateaus and domains I, uh, and wineries and yeah he could he could wine from certain places anymore correct for because he he brought this embarrassment onto france they blamed Stephen for this uh yeah. which i find fascinating the the other aspect with regards to when did Fr french winemakers start seeing the light there's great quotations to where they started after this event they started looking outside of france versus looking inside of france many of the french producers traveled to napa to see what was going on and to learn and by the way it is not an accident that in 1979, Baron Philip de Rothschild and Robert Mondavi founded Opus One. Three years later, it was an absolute direct result of the judgment of Paris. So to both of those gentlemen's credit, they said, okay, you guys are making great wine. Maybe we should collaborate and do something together. And Opus One was born. So you can trace the explosion of wine in every new world country from Chile Argentina, New Zealand, Australia, even regions within the United States, Paso, uh, Oregon, all of those as a result of this single event on May 24th, 1976. That, that was how profound this event was. Simply fascinating, in my opinion. Now, I know that uh, Jeff, even though his belt is tight and his chest is out because he won 100 points, has been kind enough not to taunt me about Google Earth, but I do want to show you, and I do want to talk to Chad 
about this Cabernet. So Chad, as I'm pulling up Google Earth to kind of drill into Yates, talk to us about your fondness for Cabernet, whether it's Stagecoach or Yates family and how that happens. How do you get access to this wine? Uh, this one, actually a friend and business associate kind of got, uh, got access to this. Uh, Yates is up on Mount Veter, very small vineyard, 40 acres, dates back to the 1880s when it was first planted. Um, gone through several iterations, February, for several sales and so forth. During Prohibition, they had to rip everything out and put fruit and nuts and everything in and grow something else. So um, what caught me was the fruit flavors that were coming out of this piece of property. And what's unique about uh, Yates, it's it's quite high up on Mount Veter. You go up past Hess and all of that and keep going up the mountain, get to Yates. And Yates actually sits in a bowl on the mountain. So it has its own unique microclimates within that bowl. And the bowl actually has sides that face north, south, east, and west. So you get all kinds of interesting trade winds and sun and the whole bit within that bowl. Hold that thought because I want to show that. Uh, and you're right, it's an incredible property. Uh, so most everyone knows, but for new sipsters, uh, the wine region where Cellar Angels calls home and has since 2010. For 13 years, we've been our own living mini versions of Stephen Spurrier helping the little guys get greater exposure. We live in Napa County and Sonoma County only. Uh, there is 1,500 plus wineries, licensed wineries in these two counties. And this is where the special property is. This is where the Mediterranean climate is. This is where the soil series are. This is where you have the geological shifts and all of the volcanic eruptions, the ocean influence, the maritime influence. You have so many different soil types here. It is an unbelievable tapestry with which to produce wine, whether it's valley floor fruit like Opus or mountain fruit like some of the great Cabernets that come out of Napa, including the Yates family. So when Chad mentions that it is on a mountaintop, if you will, let's drill in a little bit to show what the valley looks like. So here we have Napa Valley, and if I throw some borders and labels on here, you can kind of get some orientation. The Lakoya Indians, obviously, were up here, and you're familiar with a very famous cab producer by Chris Carpenter named Lakoya. But here you have Oak Knoll, Yountville, Oakville, Rutherford, Zinfandel, St. Helena, uh, and a little bit further up, Calistoga. But as you may remember, each of these little towns is about seven miles apart because that's how far the coaches went before they had to rest the horses and get them fresh water. So it's pretty cool how much history is still involved in this valley. Yates Valley is right up there in Mount Veter. And when I drill into it to Chad's point, you can see just the slope of this sides, the bowl that he's talking about right here, over here, and you have more exposure, and I'll even come around so you get a little close up. That is some serious topography. So from here down this slope into this block, this block, this almost looks like it's going straight down. Sean can ski this. I, I'll be on the greens over here on the bottom. <laughs> So where's your row? <laughs> well, they have, uh, like I said, they it, it's very small. It's about 40 some acres. They produce Cab, Cab Franc, Merlot, Vignet, um, and Sav Blanc in very limited quantities. So if you see Yates Family Vineyard on a thing, it's probably Yates, me, and four or five other people is about all that get grapes from here and matter right. of fact uh the cab franc was uh yanked out which uh they're going they're replanting and actually i got the last bit of grapes from the cab franc from 2021 and we just bottled it week a week ago so i have one barrel of 2021 cabernet uh cab sorry cab franc that uh, 
they're not going to have for probably six, seven years before any more start coming on. If we come to Napa Valley and the angels want to taste with you, can we play tennis up here? Sure. Sure. What a great place for a tennis court. Family is absolutely fabulous. The family bought this back in the 50s, if I remember correctly. Uh, grandma and grandpa bought it. Uh, grandpa's been uh, uh, passed away quite a few years ago. But incidentally, he he actually worked on the Golden Gate Bridge and in the house that they have a little apartment in, grandma and grandpa did, they have a spiral staircase made from steel from the Golden Gate Bridge. And it's painted with the same paint that's on the Golden Gate Bridge. Oh, geez, that is super cool. But if you, right, if you taste there and marry, marry one of the granddaughters, uh, uh, she will take you to grandma's apartment and that's where you actually taste. Oh and my that, goodness, that is, that's a tasting experience you don't normally get, ladies and gentlemen. So you get to go to a cupola with 365 degrees of seeing this vineyard in the middle. Incredible. Let's let's do some flavors, aromas, and uh, tasting notes on the Yates family. And by the way, I don't know if in, what's that food pairings. Um, I don't know if I can. Oh yeah. So hang on. Mission controls yelling at me in the studio. It doesn't show well because. Uh, okay. There you go. Um, Ch all of Chad's bottles are works of art and they're incredible. And this Cabernet should be $180 instead of $80 just for the sheer fruit access and bottles. Um, and, and thank you, Dahlia. I agree with you. The way I play tennis, there'd be a lot of balls over that fence on the bottom of the vineyard that would require a, a mule to go down and get, but what are we getting on the 2017, uh, on aromas standpoint? Well, with this one, you're getting a lot of intense red, red fruits. So I'm getting a lot of red currant, a little, uh, a lot of cherry also. And you got to remember, this is 95 and a half percent cab, 3% Malbec and one and a half percent cab franc. So that Malbec's bringing that red fruit out. And that's what I wanted to do is heighten that coming out, getting that cab franc finish. A little mm -hmm. bit of herbal floral notes on it. This one, I'm always like uh, some really good ribs with like a fruit barbecue sauce, you know, like a blackberry or raspberry barbecue sauce with a little heat to it. Add some cayenne pepper to it. Black pepper would be really good. Get a little bit of char on them. No, that sounds amazing. And I love the nose on this. Yeah, it's really, I've had mine open for oh, almost, almost two hours now, and it's the nose is just phenomenal. But that's what you get with the mountain fruit. I mean, uh, up there on Mount Meter, you get, you're up there kind of high, you get uh, that bowl where you're getting the cool and the warming and so forth. And uh, they have a slight bit of volcanic soil up there. Well, um, and it's, it, to your point, it, it's pretty high up, and I know several of the folks actually have been there, not not to Yates family, but when you get up into the mountains, and Sean and Marilyn, have, we've experienced this a number of times, it's interesting when you're up above the fog line, and, yeah. and, the, val and the valley floor is in fog, but this mountain fruit is just getting basked in sunlight, so it's ripening, and it gets all those flavors that are developing Whereas the Valley floor fruit is still a little bit shut down. It's in cloud cover, it's in fog, and they just get so much more hang time up here. And how does that contribute to the overall flavor profile? Well, the longer it hangs, usually the more intense fruit flavors you get, the more complex they are. So that's what we're kind of excited about this year. It's been kind of cooler there in Napa this year. So we're thinking harvest is going to be later. So that hang time is going to get these incredible fruit flavors. And that's what I think you're getting from this. Uh, um, because uh, with the Cabernet, you're, you're kind of shielded with, with, and as you can see from the pictures we saw, there's a lot of trees right around. Mm -hmm. So you get a lot of shadows uh, with a bowl being there too, and the sun being behind you and up on the mountains and so forth. There's a lot of shade up there. So you get a lot of cooling effects 
And of course, on the mountain, you're going to get some wind too that cools it down also really quick. And and in all seriousness, not that we would be playing tennis or anything, how do people, if they come to the Valley or if they want to taste with you, do they call the Yates family? Do they make an appointment or how does that occur? Uh, you can uh, try to. They do do private tastings up at the Yates family uh, if they're available. Um, Mary. Uh, what about tasting with you? Uh, if I'm out there, I would be happy to uh, do that. And we can uh, definitely put out anytime I'm going to be out there, we can put out an email blast. I'll let you and Denise know and let people know. And if they want to come out and so forth, we could actually do something like that. And if they wanted to order this wine, in addition to it being on Cellar Angels, how do they do that? Contact me directly uh, via uh, email or my phone, and we can get you all set up with uh, awesome. the wines. Good, good, good. Uh, Chad, I can't thank you enough. It's first, always good to taste the wines you make. Even better to see you and do it virtually. Even the best to see you and do it in person. But absent that, uh, thanks for sharing your wisdom and guidance this evening on the Judgment of Paris and everything it meant. Uh, um, hopefully we can cross paths again soon because this wine is spectacular and really something special. So thanks for pursuing your dream uh, and having us be able to share the story with you tonight. Well, thank you very much. I hope you all enjoyed it. Very much so. And Sipsters, it bears repeating, uh, you know, very similar to the Stephen Spurrier model, we don't do this without you. And you being able to share with other wine lovers, hey, you need to check out this company, Cellar Angels. And this is where we get our wine from. That cannot be overstated. So uh, again, we, we do this trying to elevate wine producers like Chad and, and the many others in the Valley. Larry, I see you on, who was also instrumental in sharing uh, some great tips and information on the judgment of Paris. This is what it's all about. You are literally voting with your fingers versus your feet because how you click and where you hit submit makes a difference. All of us together can actually change the trajectory of the wine industry. That's pretty cool. And oh, by the way, there's wine. So thank you so much for all your support. Next week, the angels are off. So uh, we have a social event to attend to at a place called the Friendly Confines. But the following week, there's a winery that we're featuring called Ramsgate. And you're going to want to see this because if you've been to Napa, you've driven by it. And you shouldn't make the mistake because I did for years. So everyone, thank you so much for the opportunity to be with you this evening. We, we love that you have us into your homes every single Friday or most every Fridays. We don't deserve it, but we're taking it. And uh, we can't thank you enough for the support. Be good to one another. Enjoy some great wine. And thank you so much for being on this journey with us. Cheers, all. Thanks, Chad. Thank you.